In the last lecture, we talked about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and Hardy-Weinberg pr presented a formula that calculated gene frequencies in a population. In other words, what proportion of individuals were homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, heterozygous. Now, honestly, just knowing how many are heterozygous versus homozygous dominant may not be information that's all that useful, but what the formula is really used for is to compare a population for this particular trait over time. The Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium says that it will, if a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, it says that the gene frequencies are stable, that they're not changing over time um, for that particular trait. And if the gene frequencies do change over time, so I check the population and the frequency of P is 0.5, and then 100 years later, the frequency of P is dropped to 0.2, that would mean that, that evolution is occurring. And that's the idea of the Hardy-Weinberg principle, is that it gives us a mathematical formula to calculate and decide if a population is stable for a particular trait, if that trait is stable, or if that trait is evolving. So um, there are five conditions that would be necessary for a population to maintain Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. The first is that there can't be any mutation. So if we're looking at, say, a population of mice, and mice can have either black eyes or red eyes, if a mutation happens that more mice suddenly have red eyes because of a genetic mutation, that's obviously going to change the gene frequencies. Second, we need the population size to be large. Smaller populations tend to have less variation in them, and they are more subject to something called genetic drift, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Third, there has to be random mating between the individuals. In other words, in a lot of uh, organisms, the females, because they're the ones that are uh, offering extended parental care, are very picky about what males they mate with. If, if male mice with black eyes, let's just say, uh, get to mate more, that's going to change the gene frequency. So we need the females to not be picky about which males they mate with, whether their eye colors are black or red. Uh, number uh, four, no natural selection. So in other words, it can't be more favorable to have black eyes compared to red eyes. And finally, no gene flow. Gene flow is sort of a fancy word for migration, immigration in or out of a population. If organisms leave, their genes leave with them. So that could throw off the gene frequencies. Or if new organisms come in, one of the things that has changed the way humans look is all of the travel that we can do now. If you think about it, you know, hundreds of years ago, we would have been very sequestered and we would have only married and mated and breeded with people in our own community. And we would have never migrated away from that and that would have kept our, our population somewhat closed. Now, we move everywhere and we intermarry. And so, you know, the way that we look has changed. So gene flow, uh, literally the genes coming in or leaving when you migrate would change a population. Okay, so I just gave you the five things that are necessary to maintain equilibrium. You'll notice this slide basically states the same five things, but the opposite. These are the things that disrupt Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So number one, if there are mutations, that's going to throw off equilibrium. It's going to change the frequency of a trait um, if there's a mutation that causes more or less individuals to have that trait. Second, gene flow. Again, migration in or out is going to change the uh, frequency of traits if all the red-eyed mice leave or if a new group of mice merges with the original group uh, and all the new mice coming in are mostly black-eyed mice, that's going to affect things. Third, again, if there's non-random mating, meaning that organisms are picky and are choosing specifically organisms with that trait or organisms without that trait, it's going to change the gene frequencies. Fourth, natural selection. If the trait is beneficial, having black eyes helps you to survive better, you're going to see the, those uh, black-eyed mice having more babies, passing that trait on, and it's going to become more common in the next generation. And finally, small population size. If the population size is small, again, you're going to see limits to variation to begin with, but on top of that, the population is going to be very subject to something called genetic drift, and that's what I want to talk about now. So what is genetic drift? Genetic drift is a random process that occurs in small populations where basically a rare allele gets wiped out just by chance. Frankly, it doesn't even have to be that rare because if the population is small, everything is rare because there's a small number of organisms to start with. Um, 
the difference between natural selection and genetic traits is if all the red-eyed mice disappear because having red eyes is bad and they can't survive as well, that's natural selection. If all the red-eyed mice disappear just because of random chance, because those mice, there were only a few of them and they didn't happen to breed, that is genetic drift. So it has to be by random chance, and it always is in small populations. And what can happen is an allele can become what's called fixed. When an allele is fixed, it means every single organism in the population is homozygous for that particular trait. So everybody might become big B, big B, and basically the allele little b is gone from that population. Um, and you can actually have several populations that start off the same and become separated from one another, and they literally go through genetic drift in different directions. So in, in you know, 100 years, the two populations um, have gone through speciation. They have become two completely separate species, and it's solely, um, you know, it, for a particular trait, it may solely be just because of genetic drift, not because that particular trait was good or bad. Um, this is a little... Um, picture of it showing rabbits, how this is a small population of only 10 rabbits, and the frequencies of P and Q are 0.5 when we start. But a random five rabbits produce offspring, and that shifts the gene frequencies now. If there's only 10 rabbits in generation two, notice that P has gone up to 0.7 and Q has dropped to 0.3. Uh, and then if only two of those rabbits survive, you might end up with a population where uh, all 10 of those rabbits are big A, big A, homozygous for the trait. I also have an online animation I'm going to show you now. Okay, so I found this little online animation. You put in the population size. We're going to start with the allele frequencies being 0.5 and 0.5, and we're going to let this population of 1,000 individuals reproduce for 100 generations, and I'm going to plot it. And notice what happens. I'm just randomly plotting it multiple times, and notice how the gene frequencies really stay about the same. All right, now I'm going to cut this population uh, down from a thousand to a hundred and let me clear everything and now notice what happens when I drop this to just a hundred individuals we see that it's way more likely not every time but it's way more likely that the genes become fixed in one scenario everybody's big B big B in another scenario everybody's little B little B if I cut this population down even more to just starting with 10 individuals and notice what happens now, every single time, randomly, just by, just by reproducing uh, that small number of individuals, the gene frequencies become fixed, either as big A, big A, or little a, little a. So this is a simulation to show you examples of genetic drift. And again, if I was to do 10,000 individuals, it would be very unlikely that an allele would get wiped out, that you'd end up with everybody homozygous, just because of the sheer number of organisms it's going to increase the variation and the chances of genes getting passed on. Two other specific types of genetic drift um, that I want to talk about. The first one is called the founder effect. So the founder effect is where an allele that's normally not very common ends up being more common in a small population because one of the founders, one of those who started the population, had the trait. Uh, the example that some textbooks will use of this is polydactyly, extra fingers, in a, a group of Amish because one of the founders had that particular trait and they're a small closed population, the trait has become very common in that population compared to the general population. The second one is called the bottleneck effect. You know how the neck of a bottle is very small. If there's a natural disaster, what can happen is only a few individuals survive. You imagine some massive natural disaster and the only individuals that survive, the only humans that survive it on the entire planet are some little tiny group of people in a village in Sweden. If the earth got repopulated, everybody would look a lot different than they do now because you would have wiped out all these variations and only this little random group survived. Again, notice how both of these, again, go along with drift. This is a random thing. This is not a trait being common because it's good or a trait getting wiped out because it's bad. This is a trait happening to be common because of a small population and random chance or a trait getting wiped out because of a natural disaster and random chance. And I have a couple of diagrams to show this. So this is bottleneck. As you can see, you start with all this variation, but only a few survive, and now the green and the red beads are gone. Not because they were bad, but because there were just a few survivors. Uh, founder effect, you know, this beetle gets blown over to an island. Now most of the beetles on the island, or all the beetles are red, even though on the mainland they were a mix.
And another example here where a bird brings a seed over to an island, and now the island population of flowers are all orange, whereas the mainland had more yellow. So this is a, another example. All right, when organisms become separated from one another to the point where they can no longer mate, they are considered separate species. The definition of a species is that you have to be able to mate and make fertile offspring. If not, you are what are called reproductively isolated. In other words, you don't have to physically be separated. If your genes can't mix, you are separate species. So this can be subdivided into two different things. Prezygotic isolation is what it's called when the organisms are considered separate species because of something ha that happens prior to making a zygote or a fertilized egg. It could be geographic isolation. They don't come in contact with each other. The European swallow and the African swallow may be considered separate species. Even though you could mate them in a lab, they're separated and they don't mate in nature. Temporal isolation. Sometimes two groups uh, change enough from one another that they mate at different times of the year. So even though they come in physical contact with each other, if one group is only in their mating season in March and the other doesn't come into their mating season until June, they're never going to crossbreed. Third, behavioral isolation. You could have a situation where a courtship ritual is very specific and one group of birds and another group of birds, although physically they could mate, they don't recognize each other's courtship song or dance or whatever, and so they don't mate with one another, they would be separate species. Mechanical isolation. You can actually end up with a situation where they become mechanically different, physically different, but their sex organs literally won't match up. And finally, gametic isolation. Basically, they might try to mate, um, but sperm and egg can't fuse together. You can't get a fertilized egg because they're just not compatible. Post-zygotic isolation is what it's called when two organisms are similar enough that they actually mate and make a fertilized egg, but something goes wrong later. The two examples, number one, the zygote could not develop. The fertilized egg just dies. Or it dies at some point during pregnancy or it dies very young as a baby. And finally, the hybrid is sterile, like in the mule. Horses and donkeys mate, they make an offspring. The offspring is healthy and strong, but mules are sterile. So mules, you can't have a population of mules that perpetuates itself, and therefore horses and donkeys would be separate species. So these are all reasons why two groups of organisms would be considered separate species. And there's a picture of mules. Uh, this is also true of ligers are also sterile. So are z-donks, the zebra-donkey hybrid, also sterile. So they're separate species. All right, and last slide for now, um, two different types of speciation. Sometimes uh, speciation can be classified based on when it happens. So if they become separate species during a time period while they're geographically isolated from each other, it is called allopatric speciation. If they become separate species while they're still in contact with each other, it is called sympatric speciation. And typically sympatric happens in plants. Because if an animal can no longer mate with anybody around it, how's it going to mate? How's it going to pass on its genes? That wouldn't make a lot of sense. But with plants, a lot of plants are hermaphrodites. They have male and female parts. So if one tree is, is appears, especially if it ends up um, with trisomy or something like that, it can't breed with any trees around it. Its pollen's not compatible, but it can fertilize itself. The next thing you know, you've got a whole group of trees, and you've got basically a brand new species right in the middle of the old species. So this is more common with plants than with animals. All right, and uh, next lecture, we'll talk about adaptive radiation.